Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome. We're so excited uh, to be doing this panel today uh, with a, a good friend of mine who is just insane, insanely talented and doing so many incredible things. Um, I want to um, go ahead and introduce him and then we'll just dive into what hopefully will be a really um, awesome chat today. So um, <laughs> this guy is basically my age and had a career that people could dream of for their whole career. So, I mean, he's a pretty lucky dude uh, and talented and earned every bit of it, but he has been either the associate director or associate choreographer or both positions on many a show, including Come From Away, one of my all time favorite new musicals, um, Disney's Newsies, Jekyll and Hyde, the most recent revival, Il Divo, a musical affair. Off-Broadway with Here Lies Love and the national tours of 9 to 5 in Disney's High School Musical, uh, among many other things. Um, I'm going to introduce him. Oh, and he also, of course, teaches all over, but uh, including Broadway Dance Center um, in New York. Uh, Mr. Richard Hines. Uh -huh. Woo! Hey. Um, so he's incredible. And um, we'll get to a Q&A uh, at the end. But um, Basically, uh, you know, Ricky, I just said, I was like, I was telling him in the private meeting, I was like, I've never called you Richard, can I call you Ricky? So, um, Ricky, um, and I met when we were on tour, I joined the tour, uh, Greece Das Musical, uh, which was the European tour of Greece, and um, he had already been on the tour, and uh, how long were you out there? How long in total? Because you were out there after I left. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was out there for like nine months total. Oh, maybe you went. I think I was there before you because I started. In you were February. there before me, and I think actually we we did do your last show because you did the whole like Spangles thing for your for the joke at the end. That's right. I forgot. Yeah. <laughs> um, awesome. Okay, so he and I met doing this crazy tour in Europe, and uh, what an incredible time that was. It was uh, just before and then post nine eleven. So it was. Uh, we were there for this major shift um, in in the world um, and had to go on together as a company, decided to go on together as a company um, on 9-11 and uh, really bonded. I think the, the company, wouldn't you say, Ricky, in a, in a way that was very, very different, of course, than it was before. Um, and, um, and then Ricky left. Uh, I wasn't long after him in leaving, um, but then um, he came back to New York and... Uh, so this started, Spangles, the idea of that kind of started on the road, right? Yeah, for sure. Okay, so um, our friends Gina and Sonia um, and Ricky would do these just, and sometimes Spencer, other people, but they would do these insane, like, horrible 80s, like, dance moves, but with all of the most amazing spirit and commitment in the world, <laughs> and um, would just entertain us, and they would work it into shows and it was just the most it was so much fun as a cast and then this turned into i could not believe it because i didn't realize it was a thing and my my friend sally melfi now married but was in uh in the company he turned it into like a company a full-blown company that was in the macy's thanksgiving day parade i literally thought i was in the twilight zone i was watching the thanksgiving day parade it was like those are my friends. I was like, that was an inside joke blown national. What, what just happened? And then America's Got Talent happened. And it was just like this crazy thing. So talk to me about how that went from a joke in a show into a full blown thing that was on two, at least two TV shows. Yeah, I mean, it was crazy. We got back from tour and all of those people that you mentioned, we wanted to create an outlet where people could get together in a space and be creative and we could all develop work and this felt like a very specific niche that like nobody was doing yeah so, like everyone loves 80s like you put the song footloose on at any party and everyone's like yeah whether you lived in this moment or whether you look back at those movies and you think wow what a cool time that was um, but everyone just loves leg warmers and scrunchies and all that fun stuff. So we started getting people together and making these like really amazing, like low, low budget music videos that we started posting on YouTube 
and I think we had like a MySpace page or a Friendster page when that was like remember that. that? Oh my god! <laughs> um, and people like started really responding, and then out of nowhere, we get this call from an executive at Macy's Entertainment that was like, "Hey, I've seen all your videos. I'm totally obsessed. Will you guys do like this short minute video?" for Thanksgiving that we could sort of like promote. And we were like, oh my God. So we went, it was like full out. We sent it to them. The execs loved it. They ended up posting it on all their social media. And then they came back to us like shortly thereafter. And they were like, we actually want you to be in the parade if you're okay with that. And we were like, I think we can do that. So the, it's an all female company and the ladies actually marched the entire parade Wow. And then did our number, which was televised um, outside of Macy's and Herald Square. And from that, some talent executive from America's Got Talent saw that and reached out to us and was like, hey, will you come on to the show? So we did their New York audition. They loved it. We got moved through. But the issue that we ran into was they wanted us to go to Vegas and go directly on to the show. But part of the contract was you can't have any artistic representation if you join into their show because they now want to represent you and own basically your content. Right. And because we were all Broadway performers. Right. And all individuals. Yeah. It didn't right. Make sense for us all to get rid of that, to go on to a talent show when we were all developing our careers. So we said no. And then they came back and I mean, they, tried so many different loopholes to get us through to like try to get us onto the show but um by that point like three of the girls had booked a broadway show i was moving on to something so it just sort of fizzled away and now and now we get together and we still do it for fun it's it was so it's so inspiring because i think that's you and i are very are similar in the way that we kind of created our own path you know what i mean like we Absolutely. really started our own thing and um just because we're like trying to fill a niche and or just trying to create our own space to create. And that's what I always admired about you because it really, uh, when you do something uh, that, especially like yourself, you did something that was so outside of any box, you know what I mean? Just embracing this kind of, uh, yeah, if you are the wrong word, but uh, embracing that kind of style and then it just kind of slung shot really quickly into this, uh, crazy thing, which is amazing. So um, I know I see a lot of people on this uh, watching right now, a lot of familiar faces, a lot of new faces and people I know. I love, my friend Elizabeth is like, I need a link to see this. Maybe. <laughs> so we're going to post a link in the chat. But um, the, um, you know, I, I know a lot of people have um, the aspirations to, of course, be a Broadway dancer and to do all that. But for you, you ended up much like myself, you went on into the production side of things before that step really happened. And I did the exact same thing. And for me, I'm such a specific type that I was like my body and my actual age and my, my face weren't <laughs> saying uh, all the same thing. So I was like, I need to figure out how do I participate in our industry that I love and do something else. And so I did, and I know, for you, what was that transition like? What was that decision like? And what was the first, two, two questions, what was your first gig being like an associate or assistant um, director and or choreographer? And then what was the first Broadway moment? How did that happen? Yeah, I mean, I only performed for like a short period because I moved to New York right out of high school. I think I performed for like five or six years before I transitioned totally out of it. I knew I always wanted to get there, but knew that I needed to take the steps and meet the people to get me there because I was so young. Um, but I, uh, my total mentor who I owe my entire career to was a gentleman, or is a gentleman named Andy Blankenbuehler who choreographed Hamilton and Bring It On and In the Heights and the recent Cats revival and all those awesome things. But he, when I moved to New York, he absolutely took me under his wing. He showed me the ropes. He introduced me to people. Um, he allowed me to take his class, be his, you know, be a body in space as he was developing movement. And, you know, he now was- at that, at, Not to interrupt you, but at that time, he wasn't really, I mean, he was a thing, but wasn't a thing yet. You know what I mean? I don't think like, he had choreographed a Broadway show by that moment. No. He was, he was performing in Man of La Mancha on Broadway. Right, yeah, he was, so you just, it was one of those things where you, he saw talent in you and you obviously saw 
I mean, because the man is like a, our modern day, you know, he's a genius and, yeah. and, and just, he can do no wrong. I saw um, Bandstand in its final weekend and I went because um, the Wrights House was looking at, as, at us to be the first, and we will be the first production of it, which I'm excited about once the non-union tour is over. But um, that show, I literally... I went kind of like this because I didn't know like what it was going to, I was like bandstand and I didn't even know who was involved. They called me that day. We'll get you comps, go and see it. We want you, we want you to look at the show. And then I didn't look at the program. Even I sat down, lights went out and I was, I had to run out the end of act one. I ran up the aisle and had to get to the bathroom because I was sobbing. Yeah. <laughs> he is just amazing. And so few people can do both jobs, direct and choreograph and not lose detail in, in one or the other, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. what an incredible mentor to have. And to and to and it's so important when you're developing those relationships because had you met him after he became Andy Blankenbuehler, that yeah. would have probably been impossible. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, well, he certainly would not be teaching class at Broadway Dance Center. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he was there literally teaching like four days a week. So I was there every moment that um, I could be there. But he, so the last performing job I did was a show that he choreographed called Waiting for the Moon, which was a musical by Frank Wildhorn about uh, the Fitzgeralds. And then from there, I was like, oh, okay, like I want to, I want to go over to the other side. And he was choreographing a musical version of uh, It's a Wonderful Life at Paper Mill Playhouse. And I asked him if he needed help and he brought me on to be his assistant. And then it was like, total craziness because in the middle of tech his production of the apple tree that he had done at encores was moving to broadway and so he just was gone for like all of tech and here i was this assistant that had never done anything at <laughs> Pimpermo playhouse with a, an amazing director named jimmy brennan and teching the show with a car a turntable all of this and i was like oh my god what's happening i didn't know what was happening <laughs> um but it was amazing but it really like threw me into the deep end like really quickly. And I came out of there and I was like, yep, this is like, I have to do this forever. I was gonna say there's uh, no, no training like being thrown into the fire, right? You cannot go to school for that. You just gotta, you gotta do it and you either swim or you sink, you know? And I, yeah. and so to me, you swam, you swam pretty hard, obviously, <laughs> which is awesome. Every day I'm um, yeah. So you, so that was kind of your first moment. And I mean, not a bad, you know, person to mentor you. And that's someone I'm sure that at some point you'll, you'll work with, because uh, I know you have, you have not yet as, uh, assisted or associate or been an associate for him on a show yet, right? Then after Paper Mill Playhouse, we haven't done a show together now. We sort of, our journeys went like this way. But sure. he's someone that he literally lives like 10 blocks from me in New York. So that's awesome. Um, yeah, he's he's pretty amazing. Um, so before we move into talking more about um, about that, are you done performing? Do you think is that something? Because you said you really wanted this, right? I'm one hundred percent done. Yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Sometimes you just know. Um, so you know, I it perfectly transitioned to what my next 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 question was, which is about building relationships. So you know, obviously they need to be organic and there are, and very much like, you know, you say go to, if you're in New York, go to Broadway Dance Center. If you're in LA, go to wherever, you know what I mean? Like if you're a dancer specifically wanting to link up with a choreographer, but, um, and obviously various ways to do that as an actor for like a director. You know, I have people reach out to me all the time, ask, can I come watch? Can I assist? Can I, whatever, you know, which is a, a great way to kind of maybe break in the door. But how would you suggest the best way of like organically building a relationship. I know with a non, with a person like when Andy was, before he was Andy, that's easier because he is not looking at you like, what are you trying to get from me or out of me? You know what I mean? He's just a fellow artist kind of at the same level at that moment in time. Um, but if like, for example, like you're teaching at Broadway Dance Center and you have your resume, you know, how do you develop a relationship with someone like you to try to that get that next step in your career? Do you know what I mean? To try to propel yourself forward. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's interesting. Like even my relationship with Andy, when I started connecting with him, I had seen him in a million shows. 
I had taken this class, like I had certainly put the work in. So by the time I made the initiative to sort of reach out and start, start to try to cultivate that relationship, he was very aware that it was because I w was aware of what he was and what he did. You know, sometimes I have people that, you know, will come take class or send an email that I've never seen, have never had any interaction with. And it feels very like they're just there to get something out of it. Mm -hmm. There are other people where, you know, it takes time to build that relationship. You can't just go take someone's class or shoot someone an email um, and then think you're going to be in the room as their assistant on a Broadway show. So I think as long as people put the work in and I see one of my beautiful assistants on here, Ruby, who I met at her school uh, where she was a, a student at IAMT here in New York. And she totally got my style. She was an awesome dancer. She reached out to me and she kept always sort of being around where I was. And I was like, okay, this person is actually serious about this experience and journey. And you don't feel like you're just a number because luckily Ruby and I have been able to work together and she just assists me on a huge number we did for Broadway Cares with 57 people. Amazing. But if I knew that I could trust her and have her be my voice because that's what you need in an assistant. If I'm doing something else across the room, if someone goes to her, I need to know that I have that trust. And that doesn't come from overnight. I've known Ruby a, a couple of years now, but that was probably the first really big thing we did. And it took that time, but she wants that. And so she was there that whole journey. And you, you see those people, you recognize those people, and those are the people you want to work with. Yeah, absolutely. What about like, as a, if it's just a, someone who doesn't have like aspirations or doesn't realize yet they have aspirations to be behind the table. What about developing those relationships as a, from a dancer choreographer point of view? Is that just literally just showing up and taking class or, you know, as an actor, is it just coming in time and time and time and time and time and time again to audition and hopefully get called back and develop that relationship in the room? Like, I know that sounds like such a inane question, but I know so many people, it's always like, how do I develop, you know, how do I get that connection? Because so much about this business is truly relationships and who you know. And sometimes talent takes a back seat to that. Um, we've seen that happen. Obviously, it's nice when it all works hand in hand. But <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, what do you think? Really, I think it's very similar to what I was just saying, but just on a different level in the sense of, you know, people, first of all, if you take my class more than someone who is in the room that doesn't, doesn't mean that I'm going to cast you over that person, right? At the end of the day, it's about what the job requires, but it's always helpful for anybody that if I have some relationship with somebody, whether they're coming into dance, sing, or act, you know, even if they don't have their best moment, I can vouch for them because I'm like, oh no, I know what this person can do. They should absolutely move forward. Um, but again, I think we are all smart enough people to know when that um, is a genuine, somebody is really wanting to develop and nurture and create some relationship with somebody. And when it is just somebody looking to get ahead and we can smell those people a mile away and you know doesn't mean that things will not happen for those people but those are not particularly people that i respond to or tend to gravitate towards so that's for moi amen <laughs> um i couldn't agree more um what has been the most impactful piece that you have worked on like that impacted you as an artist the most I, hands down, that'll be Newsies for many, many, many reasons. I mean, I saw that in a movie theater in 1992 and I remember being like, oh, it was when I learned that it was okay for boys to dance and oh, that cool. it can be strong and masculine. And even more than that, that it could tell that kind of story and make you feel that. I had never, ever seen that happen ever, especially on film. So to see that movie was, you know, incredible in that moment and then to fast forward and have that be the show that i made my broadway debut on as an associate director there's all of that but then to be in the room with the people that made that movie and get to talk to them and then build those relationships was amazing and then when we filmed the netflix production at um out in la all the original cast from the movie came to that and we had like a party to meet all so it was just like 
the amount of win and experience that came from that job was amazing. And as cheesy as it sounds, um, that opening night on Broadway, my mom was sitting next to me and that, that horn started, that little bah, 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 and I just started crying and I was like, this is exactly where I'm supposed to be, right? Like this is all of that work that I've done. I was grateful that my Broadway debut was not ever as a performer, but as a creative because I, years of my heart and soul were on that stage because we had developed that show for like three years before our um. So my only uh, thing I have to ask about Newsies is where is Patrick's mother? <laughs> if you actually go on YouTube and you type in Newsies Paper Mill, I, I think if you actually type in Patrick's mother, we actually recorded a version of it um, because like all the fans when they came to Paper Mill, which was where we premiered it, where they were like, what where is it but yeah. it was really amazing when we were developing the show because everyone was like who the hell is patrick like I know. <laughs> you sing the whole thing about patrick you never meet pat and then they were like okay well should we put patrick in and make and then you're like so we're literally gonna build a character because everyone loves this like eight bars that this woman belts out they were like cut 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 oh uh, it was just this i uh, that that show was amazing but it was the saddest moment for me i was like oh no where's patrick's mother <laughs> i feel like my biggest contribution to the show was Jeff Calhoun, our brilliant director who I was working alongside. He had never seen the movie, never heard a song, knew nothing. So we were sort of like a good partnership because I was like, you can't do that. The fans will be upset. You can't do that. Um, but they actually cut the song um, once and for all. Uh. Did the first like table read. It was not there. It was like a, a, a version of, it was called, called Once and For All, but it was not the song that we know. And Jeff was like, yeah, like it, the song is okay. And I was like, do you know what the real version of this song is? And he was like, no, I've never heard it. I was like, oh my God. I was like, I think I have the CD. Let me get the CD. Um, and I played it for him and he was like, well, what the hell? So we had this meeting with Alan Menken literally the next day and Jeff played it and he was like, this is an amazing song. Why aren't we using it? And he was like, oh, well, I just didn't know if it was right for the moment. And Jeff was like, no, we're using this. So um, that little tag that happens like at the front end of the song, there's change coming. Yeah. Sort of what the whole song was completely stretched out. So Alan was oh, like, wow. hey, we'll meet in the middle. Let me have that little trio for Jack, Catherine and Davey. And then we'll give you the number. Which is which is beautiful. I think honestly that that is something that was an improvement. I think that's um, was a really nice, that's where you, you see collaboration and artistry doing its thing at its best, which is wonderful. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so explain real quick um, to people who may not know the difference between an assistant, an associate, um, and then, you know, between those two things, obviously you've been an associate like on every Broadway show, which is uh, on all the ones that you've done, which is incredible because that's not, terribly I feel like terribly common like to just launch into an associate type thing um so explain the difference between the two and then I have some more specific questions after that I mean it sort of depends how the person you're working with uses you in that position but I would say usually if you're in an assistant position you can still be as involved in the creative process as an associate I think for me what I find the biggest difference is, is come opening night the assistant's job usually is done Whereas an associate, my job is to stay on to all of those shows for as long as they run and do all of the maintenance and cast changeovers and um, for come from away, I went and set all five, well, Broadway, we all did as a team, but all the other companies, I went and set every one of those companies. So Toronto, Tour, London, Australia. And then I go and check in on every one of those companies as I'm well. I'm watching your, your social just going like, oh my God the life this man is living. You are literally all over the world putting up my favorite show in the world. It was just so cool to watch that happening. Um, which I wanna... really, like a, and the associate, it's great because for me, I never get to say goodbye to the shows. <coughs> until it's really time to say goodbye to those shows. So, you know, for Newsies, I was there from day one, literally until mm -hmm. closing night of Broadway and the tour. So it's just amazing to continue that journey through all of those shows. Um, 
through that whole process. So, and I want to get into, uh, we're definitely going to talk about um, <clears throat> what that is like, like once the show is essentially yours, I'm going to say, for lack of better way to put it, um, and you're, you've kind of taken over, I want to talk to you about the audition process, about, you know, because, um, you know, I know that largely you are the voice, unless the, unless the um, uh, creative team, like the director and the choreographer, want to be there or want to be involved, you largely represent them uh, in a casting process and, um, and then obviously in a rehearsal process. So, um, but we'll get into that in a second. So what was um, maybe the, as an associate, I know sometimes it's such a, which is, I like it's such an, it is such an art to know how to be an assistant or an associate because you really truly have to respect the person that you are under and you have to have be very like-minded and you have to know how to communicate, you know, with actors in a way that, you know, is, is sometimes maybe not giving them information that is say, cause not everyone can agree on everything. So say you have to convey some direction or some choreography that maybe you don't agree with, but you have to act as though like this is coming from you, you know what I mean? That you do agree with it. So there's so much, there's such an art that goes into that. Um, so what was maybe a, um, a show that allowed you to flex your own creative, because I know you also, he, by the way, directs and choreographs on his own all over, has worked at like every major, major regional theater, except for 3D, um, <laughs> all, over the, all over the country. We, um, we will we'll get you when you're not all over the world setting come from away. I mean, no big deal. Huh. Um, but with, um, but yeah, I mean, so, what was one that maybe allowed you to flex your own creative muscles or like a, a specific maybe artist that you've worked with that was like, you know what, can you just go and can you handle that scene? Can you stage that scene? Or can you, you know, fill these eight counts of choreography? I trust you go, you know, something like that. I mean, I've been fortunate that all of the shows that I've worked on, the people that I've been collaborating with are people that I've had long, long, long relationships with except for right before this all happened, I was working on the Broadway revival of Company. And that team, it was my first time working with anybody on that team at all. But the nice thing to your point, like with Come From Away, the <coughs> choreographer Kelly Devine that I work alongside, I have known her for many, 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 many years. So there is a trust that goes beyond anything that happens in the artistic world, but she knows that I am there for her through everything. So I would say Come From Away was really amazing for Kelly and I because it was the first time both of us had ever worked in a room with 12 amazing people that were not dancers in the least bit and would agree to that uh, if you ask them. And so we had to find a vocabulary that made them comfortable, we couldn't really speak dance terms. Like you wouldn't say pas de bourre in a come from away rehearsal. Someone would pass out, I think, if you said that. <laughs> we also, like as silly as it sounds, we stopped wearing like dance clothes to rehearsal because they just kind of like felt like, oh God, it's that dance moment. And we we're like, you're literally going to walk around that chair for eight counts. Like you've got this, you can totally do this. So we, we both of us together learned a completely new vocabulary to an art form that both of us have literally been doing since we were like three years old. That's amazing. Um, and it was amazing. And you know, at the end of the day, those 12 dancers got to dance on stage with the Rockettes at the Tony Awards. And that was just a shock for all of us involved. So was that, was that the thing you posted? I forget, but it was hilarious about how they were talking at, like as if they were in rehearsal and they were talking at the, was that the Gypsy Award? The, Gypsy. That was that. Okay, when they were talking at the audience, like as if they were in a rehearsal, that yeah. was so, um, that's another one that you guys got to look up. It is so funny. It's come from away, Gypsy of the Year, and it was our take, you know, the Gypsy of the Year is like the show spoof each other, but it was our version of like, if we could go back and cast this show with like 12 of the best dancers, what would the show look like? And we redid Welcome to the Rock with these incredible dancers that dressed exactly like their counterparts and, and they're doing like aerials and backflips and flat <laughs> turns and like totally inappropriate. It is so funny. Up. I died, I died laughing. It was so creative and the cast pulled it off 
so brilliantly. It was so well done. Um, so like getting into, into talking about uh, Come From Away real quick before we go into the audition part. Um, just tell us a little bit about that. That truly, um, it was so impactful. I went to that year I saw Dear Evan Hansen, Come From Away. Um, oh gosh, I can't even remember. It was like, it was such an incredible theater trip the, the year, everything I saw that year. And I saw, oh, Bandstand, I think was that maybe that year. Um, and um, I saw the original company um, of Come From Away. And it was another one I went into, um, I didn't even know at the time, I don't think I knew you were even involved with it. I went because someone told me like, you have to see this show. And I was thinking like, how in the hell do you make a show about 9-11? And I was just like, again, kind of arms crossed and just thinking like, I don't think it's gonna be my thing. And from the moment it started, I was like edge of my seat. And that the, the, the choice to not have applause, except for after that opening number and at, at the end of the number, it, you, I literally felt like I was experiencing it with them and I for, would have to remind myself to breathe. And it was the very first show I think I've ever cried multiple times, but from happiness, because I was just, it gave me so much faith that there are really truly amazing people in this world that do incredible things. I think we're seeing some of that right now, um, you know, in, in what we're going through. But I mean, what an incredible experience to be a part of and what an incredible story to tell and the way that you guys chose to tell it. Um, talk about maybe some of those early meetings and how much did the show evolve? You know, um, it was also, I love the fact that I think everyone from La Jolla came, right? If not like most everyone. Everyone, but one person did. So basically, the show, we had five incarnations before we got to Broadway. So we did La Jolla, Seattle, DC, Gander. We went to the town and did a concert. And then we went to Toronto. And then we came to Broadway. Um, but both in Seattle and I'm sorry, in La Jolla and Seattle, because of the contracts that the show was under, we had to have two local people in both of those companies to meet the union requirements. So the Oz and the Janice from La Jolla, we had a different Oz and Janice in Seattle. And then when we moved on from there, we took one from each company and then that company stayed with it through. Um, I think the thing that made that show so powerful for me to work on is we never, I mean, rarely, I should say, do we get to work on a show where you're telling the story of an entire cast of people that are still alive. Mm -hmm. So we can actually see these people, meet these people. They came to see the show and they would offer feedback. And of course, not all of the characters are an exact yeah. parallel. Some of them are amalgamations and whatnot, but to be able to get that amount of uh, information and content that is literally coming, it hasn't gone through any filter, but you're hearing it directly from the source. It was incredible. And the other thing that was great was because we were played so many cities before we came to Broadway we had time to keep nurturing and nurturing and then of course the icing on the cake was we went to Gander the full everyone for six days and we did two concerts in the ice rink that we talk about in the show where they stored all the food um, oh yeah we did two concerts 3,000 people at each and it was as if like the Beatles had arrived in Gander. I, I mean, the cast walked out and there's just that Balron fill. Yeah. Typically in the show, we wait eight counts and then they're directed to start talking. I think he literally stood there for like 32 to 40 counts. And wow. people were just, and the cast is crying. And now they're all panicking because they're like, oh my God, we have to do this dialect in front of these people that speak <laughs> and we don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> Um, and it was amazing. And they have um, a really incredible refugee program there as well. And the woman who is the character of Beulah in our show, she purchased like 20 seats for the front two rows and had all of these refugees that she had helped come into Newfoundland sitting there. So, I mean, the love amazing. in the room and they hung American flags all over the hockey rink for us. It was like, it was really powerful. And it felt like, we knew we were telling a good story, but that felt like we were actually telling their story because every one of them gave us basically the seal of approval. And then we had four days that they took us on school buses to all of the locations that we talk about in the show. So when these characters are now talking about the Dover Fault or the Legion, they were like, I've been in that building. I've stood on that cliff. I went into the airport. You know, we did it all. So again, there's 
you know, something like that, that just, that just doesn't happen very often. If you know, that had to be, uh, that would, just hearing it, it would have to be one of the most um, incredible, you know, moments uh, of someone's career to be a part of something that like that. That's pretty, pretty, that was very similar. I mean, in a totally different way, but the night that we all went on as a cast um, during 9-11, the way that um, the entire audience of, we were in, in um, Munich, Germany, it was our opening night, right? It was our opening night. And um, the way that they embraced us and, and cheered and clapped, and it's just, it's truly, those types of moments. I you remember, but remember we were gonna start the show and, the Kent stage manager, people had left us like cards and flowers. Like all these people had brought this stuff for us for 9-11 as like just we're here for you. And they left it all on the lip, like the front of the stage. They were all just like walking yeah. down, leaving cards and flowers. And I then we remember. did um, a moment of silence before the show. And then we did, it was um, unreal. Yeah, especially if you're doing this. And I think it was uh, weirdly cathartic for, uh, because we, it was such a, I mean, Greece is like, you know, the anti, <laughs> it's just so like high energy and, and somehow it was incredibly therapeutic and kind of what we all needed, but we didn't realize it. But yeah, that was, that was, you know, an, an incredible moment. Um, so with, um, with all that, you know, you've had, you know, all these incredible experiences. Now, now you get to set, we'll talk about, you know, newsies and, and, and come from away as examples. Um, you set these shows, um, you know, all over. So, now, as a dancer or an actor or whatever, like when you're in a room, say for example, as a dancer, you're in a room for a Broadway call and there's a million other people that are, or maybe not a million, but a lot of other people that are really, really, really incredible. How do you, how do you stand, especially if you don't have a relationship with someone in the room, what is, a, what is something that draws you to a performer that, you know, when you're in charge of casting a replacement or what have you, um, yeah, what is something that you kind of look for in the I room? Mean, it sounds like horrifically cliche, but really like- So is the question, so that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> people that are just there living in the moment in their truest, honest form, we feel that, we sense that, we know that. Those are the people we want to work with. You can feel where it's, too hungry that it, it, it sort of pushes you off a little. You can feel when it's dishonest, you can feel when it's forced. And, you know, those people, we need a lot of people to work in our industry. So those people do work. But for me personally, I need people that I know are like 100% a team player. And I can promise you if it's like a dance call, by the time you come to even do it in the groups of four, five, three, whatever it is, I've already taken notes on your resume and already know in my mind whether you're going to go on or not. And that's from, how did you pick up the combination? Were you respectful when we were switching lines? Did you actually switch lines or did you <laughs> get confused and then move further down front? And you're like, okay, I saw that. You know, it's all of those little things that you just read in a room. And those are the people we want to work with because we ourselves are going to be vulnerable in the room. And I need to know that I have people that are going to have my back. They're going to support me. Um, and they're not just there to get a credit and not just there to, you know, for their ego. Amen. Um, That's a perfect, perfect yeah. answer. Cause I couldn't agree. I always tell, I always tell people when I do like an audition workshop, I can smell, I can smell you before you come in the room. Like whether that's like your green energy, your desperate energy, the hungriness, whatever it is, but it's always those who just are, that's why people always say I booked the gig that I never wanted because it's like you go into those rooms with a totally different energy or the ones you're like, I don't have a shot in hell at getting this gig. And you book it because you're just, your defenses are down and you're not like, yeah. you know, trying to snatch the gig, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, hold on, then we're going to move into um, some Q and a stuff, but uh, real quick um, working on, TV versus um, Broadway theater. I know you've you've done both. Like you've had to choreograph uh, for Encore, right? Um, for uh, Disney Plus Encore. Um, so doing that kind of schedule versus like a Broadway schedule. Like, did you have a preference? You like both mediums for different reasons. I like them. I mean, it's different when you're doing Broadway. It feels like it's really 
everything is about the show. And in TV and film, what's interesting, there are so many other components to creating the final product that, you know, you're not, it, it doesn't always become about that moment. So I love both sides, but I find in TV, I have to let go a little bit more and trust that there are many other departments involved that I am not as knowledgeable about that I know will protect my product and, you know, make it look how we want it to look like Disney when we filmed it for Netflix, you know, they had a film director, but you know, none of us ever saw that finished product until the show was done. Same thing working on Disney plus Encore. It's like, you go in, you do the job. There's nine cameras on you all day, every day for seven days, but I have no idea what that final product is. So, you know, in TV film, I find you just have to give over a little bit more and trust a lot of other people where theater you have your team right there. You're at the table. You're watching that final dress rehearsal. You know, okay, that's the show. That's what's going to be. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, so, okay, we're going to go into Q and A, but I, I do get, I didn't get to tell you yet. We are, oh, first of all, sorry, backtrack. I got, I, so I went to see Come From Way on Broadway. I took my, um, my son, my best friend, my wife to see the LA company. We went on a day there was like four or more understudies on. And I was like, I could not fathom. One, one girl you could tell, um, she was a, a, a taller white female that was going on for the black um, character um, that she had never been on. You could tell she had never been on before because she was killing it. But like people were just like shoving with love. It was like, you know, <laughs> move her over a number or whatever. And I was able to watch it with that kind of eye because I had already, seen the show and so I was watch I was take, able to take it in totally differently but um I cannot imagine swinging that show we're going to do a whole another panel on swings and standbys and understudies um for people and dance captains who are interested in in that um for people who've done it on Broadway and tours and stuff but oh my lord how do you go about casting especially people who you're casting people who are not dancers and they're having to remember that intense non-stop staging on a turntable with chairs and whatever else, how do you find brains that are like that? You, you go into the audition and you pray. You yeah. just pray you're gonna find it. And they are by far the hardest tracks to cast. But the thing that's amazing about our show, and I know you've only seen those two companies, but they can really be anything, which makes our casting director for all oh, the companies yeah. sort of, you know, freak out because, you know, the woman on tour that plays Diane is a beautiful Asian woman. And then, you know, it's like, hey, yeah, Christine, Christine, I went to go see it for her. Christine's my friend. I did crazy for you with her. And I was like, yes, like, it was so cool to see. And it made me as a director go like, and when I do more research how the, the character of the black female is not, like you say, it's an amalgamation, like she's not a black female in real life, the one who lost her son. Yeah. And it's like, so it, it truly like, it, it must give your, your, um, casting team a whole lot of freedom to just absolutely the and that's why it makes the standby job a little easier because it, you know it's so you know you have to check a few boxes but it can really be anything it's not like you have to be exactly this which well, tj we just have a few minutes left in the session so we could probably fit in a uh, yeah, one we're or gonna, two questions we're gonna, go, we're gonna go into q a now um so anyone have a question for mr richard hines put your uh, hand up so i can see you Oh, good. We have uh, Tara. Tara? Tara? Tara. Tara. There she is. Yeah. Hi. Thank you so much for doing this, Richard. Of course. Um, so I was wondering, this, I, you hear, I've heard it, I've been doing theater forever, and you always hear like, oh, if you have a certain name on your resume that maybe you've never worked with the person you're auditioning for, but they may be friends with someone you've done, you know, whatever show with in the past. How often would you say you actually like pick up the phone and call <laughs> Um, you did a show with 10 years ago or, or something like that. How often are those references, we can call them, actually used? I would say that I could probably name on one hand all of the people that I've ever worked with that I did not know somebody that they were, had known on their resume. I call at least one person on your resume. Um, I called TJ about somebody the, or emailed him the other day about someone. It happens. He's on this call, actually. <laughs> it happens all the time. And, you know, your name follows you. And so yet another reason why, like, be your best self, be honest, be truthful. And 
I always, always, you know, and it doesn't even need to have to be a director that you worked with. I could see that you did a show that I know another actor was in with you that I'm like, oh, great. Somebody that can vouch because, you know, you just have no idea what you're going into if you meet somebody that you've never worked with and you have no relationship. But I do that all the time. All the time. I, I will second it. Only I, I got burned. I, I got burned twice by not making a phone call. And I never, I always, I'll even call sometimes two times just to make sure that there's like a consistency there. So I, they, I, I feel they are also important. Um, great question, um, Tara, thank you. Um, I see a Natalie Iskovich. Hi. Hi. Um, I actually have a kind of a choreography question I was curious about. Um, I auditioned for your, um, you did Newsies at La Mirada a few years mm -hmm. ago. And I know that I, or I think that that was your personal original choreography. So how was it as a choreographer after knowing the original choreography to redevelop with the same music and patternings and things like that? How did, how was that creative process for you? It was fun because I was the associate director on it. I never had to like execute the choreography. So that movement wasn't ever really in my body, which was good. But it was really hard to not hear the music, like, oh, that accent. Yeah, we always hit that accent on that accent. Um, so it certainly was hard. But the other thing that was really amazing, and I see Kyle, one of our newsies on here. Hello, Kyle. Um, I brought on a, an associate that had never done the show in any capacity before. And so that was a really nice relationship that he and I got to find together because he was hearing the music, like, completely fresh with no preconceived anything. So I really used him a lot in that process um, to help sort of develop that material because it was hard to not hear the music how I'd been hearing it for years and years and years. <laughs> That's a oh, really very good question, Natalie. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, Elizabeth. Hi. Um, hi. hi. So nice to be able to like hear from you and learn from you. Um, for us movers in the chat, um, do you have any like best practices when we find ourselves in situations where we might be in a call that's like, oh yeah, we know that we have movers and dancers in the room. Cause I always feel like those call, those types of calls are set up because you have the person next to you that's like been at the dance hall the week before and like already knows the choreo and is like picking their face. Meanwhile, you're just hoping that they see the personality. <laughs> I, I would say to you is <laughs> take all of that out of your head and just go in and do your best audition because you have no idea why you're in that room or for what track we're considering you for. And yes, maybe it's that we're throwing you into this dance call just to get an awareness because we wanna see how far can we push him or her. But I have seen so many people that come in and totally psych themselves out because they are looking at that person next to them that's doing eight pirouettes and they're like, yeah, but I can sing a high C, so you know, what up? And that, <laughs> is okay and again you will never ever ever know what is going on behind that table you know what i mean so don't get in your head about that and i would say if you've been brought there it's because obviously they're considering you for something and just trust it and just do it to the best of your ability and again like don't get in your head about it because you're going to totally psych yourself out you know what i mean Absolutely. and there is no trick it's like some people have danced for 15 years. Some have danced for four. Like, it is what it is. But again, when we're building shows, if there's something that you love about someone or you have found someone, I will change any step of my choreography to get somebody in there if I love the way they sing or their acting or their look, as opposed to being like, I can only have seven women that do eight pirouettes. You know, it takes all kinds to make a musical, all kinds. Amen. Uh, great question. We probably have time for like one or two more. I see Alyssa, Alyssa, Alyssa Wisely. Whistle. Yes. We'll see. Yeah. Whistle. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I had a similar question, uh, just about like resume formatting. Uh, cause you said you like to call the names that you know on a resume. So, and I've had this question for a while. So would you prefer to see the director or the choreographer that we worked with rather than the theater itself? Um, I, will totally like self plug myself. If you go to my website, if you look at my setup, I, you'll see I do both on there. Cool. So I'll do like the show, what my title was, where the show was, and then under what my title was, if I was only the choreographer, I would list the director. If I was the associate, I would list who I was working under. 
but to have it in like a really clean, easy format mm -hmm. that I can just scan across and be like, okay, she did this show with this person at this theater and she played this role, like easy, easy formatting. Um, yeah, I would just say have, have it all on there. Awesome, thank you. Great question. Yeah. Uh, time for like maybe one more, anyone have anything? Uh, yeah, Ariana. Hey. Hi, how are you? Good, another one of my uh, students, hello. Nice. <laughs> um, so what is your favorite part about your job slash industry? And then what is your least favorite part? <laughs> Josh, I think that's a familiar question for you. Um, I'll say really quick, my least favorite part, because it's just, it kills me, is getting through the process of auditions and then like having to cut people. You know, especially when they are people that I have a relationship with, but I know it's just not a fit for the show. And you're like, well, do I just hold them through because I love them so much? Or am I just breaking the reality to them that this is just not a fit? And, you know, that's just, for me, the worst part ever where like, I've auditioned. I know what it means to put that work in and to get a thousand pages of sides and songs and all of that nonsense. And then, you know, it just isn't a fit. So for me, I would say that sort of is like one part I don't love. And I would say um, on the flip side, my favorite part is getting to call my friends or people that are working on a show to be like, you booked it. <laughs> uh, isn't, that the, isn't that the best feeling in the world? Ah, oh, the best. I yeah. Um, you guys, I, 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 I'm so sad. I hate the end of things, but we have to go. We have another class starting in five minutes, so we have to wrap. But um, please, a virtual round of applause for the incredible Richard Hines for sharing his time with us today. 